I think you don't want to holistically necessarily look at your business and try to scale all the things at all the same time. Be really smart and strategic about what you're trying to scale and make sure that you've got the full supporting systems behind it. Meaning what happens if you wanted to bring in 100 people and you brought in 1,000? Could you handle it? Do you have the infrastructure for it? Do you have the support for it? Are you able to deliver an exceptional client experience? At what point do things break? And if you're looking at it isolated with one particular offer, it's easy to see those things. When you're trying to scale everything, sometimes you lose a lot of that because it's just so much, it's a bit overwhelming. Hey, it's the Profit Answer Man, Rocky Lalvani. If you're new to the podcast, check out my interview with Mike Michalowicz. It's episode number two. If you want to hear about each chapter in the Profit First book, go back and listen to episodes 3 through 13. Episode 1 is the why and how. On The Profit Answer Man, we learn money mastery without all the complicated accounting mumbo-jumbo using a simple system. Your accountant is busy documenting your transactions and creating a rearview mirror of what happened. My guess is you don't even look at the reports they sent you. If you're like most business owners, you struggle with this. And it's not your fault. We aren't taught money in school. And accountants aren't taught how to be profitable. The Profit First system created by Mike Michalowicz works. And he certified me to help you implement the system in your business. Remember, the new equation is sales minus profit equals expenses. Let's face it. Without cash flow, you can't pay your employees buy needed materials, or pay your mortgage and support your family. I help you to do that and more so you can focus on the parts of the business you love and receive the rewards for your labor and investment into your business. The stronger you are as a business owner, the more jobs you create, the better we are as a country. Small business owners are the backbone of America, and for that, you deserve to be well rewarded. Just remember, more revenue does not equal more profit. That's why we focus on the bottom line. Have you ever thought that growth could put you out of business? It can, and it doesn't have to be this way. Understanding how much cash you need for growth and then building robust systems and tools is the answer. It allows you to work less and make more while you grow. See, little problems and little issues get multiplied when you grow. So if you don't do it right in the beginning, you blow up with the growth. And that's what we like to avoid. It's important to have a plan up front and chart the course with a little bit of thinking to prevent a lot of heartache later. That's our topic for today. Our guest is Krista Grasso who is the go-to strategic planner and systems expert for online businesses when they want to scale. She's known as the business optimizer. She has the ability to quickly cut through the noise and provide clarity on core things that will make the biggest impact to scale a business simply and sustainably. She's the founder of the Lean Out Method, creator of the Lean Business Scaling Systems, and host of the Lean Out Your Business podcast. Let's meet Krista. Welcome to the Profit Answer Man, Krista Grasso. It's great to have you join us today. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited for our conversation. As am I. Can you share a little bit about yourself and your business? Absolutely. So I'm the founder of a company called The Lean Out Method. And I help businesses scale in simple, sustainable ways, which is something I'm just really passionate about after scaling my very first business a little bit too quickly. And it was far from simple. It was very far from sustainable. I almost put myself out of business. And that ended up being the catalyst for me, both creating the lean out method and then really going on and helping other business owners to be able to scale in a way where they don't end up in the same place I almost did. (laughs) You know, and I think that's one of the things business owners don't talk about. Scaling takes cash and it takes good operational systems. And if you don't have both, scaling, even if you're profitable, 
can lead to you blowing your business up. Sure can. <laughs> there, there might be some lived experience there. <laughs> we'll chat a little bit about that. Before we do, our favorite subject, Profit First, which I know you are a fan. So how has Profit First helped you? I just love the model so much. It's so smart. It's so simple. I love things that are smart and simple. So it fits. But who doesn't want to take their profit first? And to me, it just really simplifies how you look at your finances. And I think it helps you make really smart decisions as a business owner. So it's something that we leverage in our business. I find that it really has helped us quite a bit to, again, make those smarter business decisions. But as a result, when somebody signs on to work with us, I actually send them the book. It's not something I coach on. It's not something I do anything with personally. I just really believe in it so much that I tell them, if you don't follow this model yet, I highly recommend that you learn about it and find somebody to work with if you have any questions. And we love that. Mm -hmm. Well, and we thank you for all your support. I've found a lot of business coaches do exactly what you do because they realize that finances aren't always the part that they deal with, but they realize the importance of it. And being able to hand somebody a simple system to implement is wonderful. Now, for whatever reason, people still struggle with implementing simple. And so we'll help them and we'll get them rolling. So let's talk about some profitable things as well. What are some of the top areas where businesses are leaving money on the table? Yeah, this is unfortunately so common in business is I feel like entrepreneurs in their love of innovating and their love of creating new and going off and keeping things really exciting, they often leave a lot of money on the table by not optimizing what they already have. They don't check to really understand what's working in their business and they don't double down on what is working and find those places where even the smallest incremental improvements can have a really big impact on the bottom line. They also sometimes don't have those systems that you mentioned in place that are designed to optimize the profitability in the business. And so I'll give you an example. Let's say that you know one of the business models that you have is that you bring new business in through some sort of live workshop or webinar or something along those lines. Well, a lot of times people put so much effort into getting as many people to sign up for it as possible that they miss all of the opportunities along the way to make sure that the people who signed up actually show up, to make sure that the people who show up actually take the action they want them to take that's going to lead to the conversion. But most importantly, the number one area that I see people completely miss is what do you do with the people who weren't ready to invest and didn't buy right away? It's very few entrepreneurs that I've met with They have a really good system for nurturing those people who weren't ready yet and then re-inviting them to make that decision at a later point in time. So I think one of the biggest ones, the number one that probably has about 50 sub areas underneath it is really looking at what you're already doing, what's working and looking at where you can optimize that end-to-end system for better conversions and better profitability in what you're doing. And we just talked about this on the previous episode. 1% changes add up dramatically. So I think you threw out maybe like 10 different things there in that one little area. And if you could just improve each of those 1%, it would dramatically increase your business. And I bet you some of those could be increased by a lot more than 1%. Like all the people who said no doing something with them, maybe next year or the year after, you've got the traffic already, continue the conversation and build the trust. And then now you're building know and like in the meantime. Yeah, absolutely. And then again, new and different. People think all the time about new lead gen, but what about the existing clients that you have? And I think a lot of times people don't take the time to really understand the customer journey and they don't have something next for their current clients, or they don't have the right next thing for their current clients. So they end up with low retention rates or people who love them and would love to keep working with them or even refer them business, but they don't have a clear path to do so. So I think there's just so many different things when you look at it. And if you start with those 1% improvements, those Kaizen experiences in the business, I think that that really does help you to find where you have some money left on the table. Everyone probably loves referrals, 
you said a lot of people don't have a simple way to do referrals or a clear process. Could you give us an example of one? Yeah. So one thing that I love with referrals is referrals can feel a little awkward for the person asking for the referral and the person being asked for the referral, which is why it's frequently avoided if you wait until the end to ask for the referral. I actually like to ask for the referral right when I first start working with somebody. And that might sound weird, but here's what this is, is, hey, thanks so much. I'm so excited. Really can't wait to dive in. Just so you know, most of my business comes from referrals. So I'm really excited to be partnering together. If you're happy with what we do together, would absolutely love if you keep anybody else who's looking for the same thing that we're doing in mind. That's it. I don't ask at that point, but I plant the seed up front. And then as we go through, I will sometimes plant the seed again. And by the time I actually ask, it becomes a no-brainer. And I frequently don't even have to ask because I've planted the seed. So people go into the whole experience listening for who else could benefit from this. And so it becomes much more organic and people are really happy to refer. And the other thing is when you have a program that really delivers or a service that really delivers and people are getting great results, most people can't wait to tell other people about it. So what you can do is make it really easy for them. If it's really hard to explain what you do, if it's really hard to, you know, have somebody explain to somebody else the work that they do with you, that's not really easy to refer. But if you make it really super simple for them and you incentivize them, which most people tend to think about cash, but I will tell you my clients, the incentive they love most is a one-on-one coaching session with me as a thank you for a high ticket referral. Or sometimes I will do special bonus workshops, like I'm getting ready to lead one on how to do um, really high transformational in-person events and experiences. And so that's a bonus that people are going to get when they refer somebody. And so things like that make people want to refer you because they believe in your work. They love the experience they're having. And then you make it just that extra bit enticing and set the expectation up front for them. I like it. So one of the things that you talk about is scaling. And what should we really keep in mind as we do this? We we don't want to blow up. You kind of referred to it early on. Like, how do we prevent that from happening as we grow and scale? So when I think about the stages of business, I think in the early days, you're in what I call an emerge stage. And that's really your whole purpose for living at that point is to find product market fit. What is the right thing to be selling to the right person at the right price so I can start to get some traction here? Then eventually, once you're like, okay, I got it. I think I got it. I've got either the offer or the suite of offers. Then at that point, you're trying to grow it. And you're trying to bring in more revenue and trying to be able to serve more clients. And a lot of times people confuse that with scale. When you're growing, as you're serving more people, as you're bringing in more revenue, frequently your expenses are going up, your complexity is going up, you're having to hire your team members. Sometimes as you're growing, you're not actually growing your profits at the same pace as you know. Scale to me is really much more about that profitability. It's about being really smart. It's being able to be able to have leverage in your business so you can work with more people, make a bigger impact all those things that we all want, but you're doing it without a significant increase in the resources that you're expending. So it leads to more profit in the business and it actually sometimes gives you your time back. The problem with that is it takes simplification first. You can't just keep doing more and more of all the mores that you're already doing, call it scale, and think that that's going to translate into more time back in your day or more profit in the bank for your business. And that's a mistake that I see people make a lot. Scaling amplifies what you have. It gives you more of what you have. So if you have debt, if you have stress, if you have, you know, way too much overwork, scaling is going to give you a whole lot more of that. So you really do want to simplify first. I think that's absolutely critical. You want to build up the systems and the team in the support structure around you so you're actually positioned to be able to scale in a sustainable way. Otherwise, you always feel behind. You always feel like you're trying to catch up or keep up with the demand of all of those new clients that are coming in 
And sometimes the client experience suffers. Sometimes you burn yourself out. Sometimes you burn your team out. It's really not a great place to be. So I think that simplification is absolutely critical. And then the strategy planning systems and team that need to come together to support it. It's funny because I think as most businesses scale, they do exactly what you say. They continue to spend more and more money, bring on more and more people, and their attitude is, we'll be profitable when? Instead of saying, wait a minute, how do we build a more lean organization? How do we improve our systems and processes? How do we make everything easier? Well, I mean, in a sense, we're, we're about, we're in the process of scaling our business in a different way. But as we're scaling our business, everything we do, we sit down and we have the conversation of how do we scale without taking up any more of our time? And that is the number one driver. How do we build the systems that are done correctly up front or that are easily fixable as we notice problems occur? And so we've been really big to look into that and to be mindful of that as we go, because that's our key. We don't want to spend more time. We'll spend a little bit of money, you know, building out the systems and automating, but we definitely don't want to uh, to have it overwhelm us at all. That was the the whole key. It's part of our original values of how we built our business. And so we're not changing that. But I think for most businesses, they do. They Especially when you're in that mid-zone, they're like, oh, we got to hire this person. We got to add this. And we got to add that. And we got to bring in all these other systems. And, and they don't have good processes to begin with. And then the processes blow up because as you leverage them, <laughs> it pushes back. Anything else they should think about as they're scaling their business? Yeah, I think too, again, just the biggest misperception with scaling is that scaling is about more, more, more. And not only do I think you want to simplify from a systems perspective and you want to simplify from, you know, don't hire people for things that don't need to be done and then let them loose with no system to support them, right? You want to be really intentional with what you're doing. But I also think when it comes to scaling, sometimes the very best thing that you can do is not try to scale all the things at all the same time, but pick your core offer. Pick the core thing that is actually driving the most revenue in your business or that's the logical starting place for somebody in your business that gets them in. And then if you're smart and have a really good strategic offer suite, you can retain that person for years and years. So I think you don't want to holistically necessarily look at your business and try to scale all the things at all the same time. Be really smart and strategic about what you're trying to scale and make sure that you've got the full supporting systems behind it. Meaning what happens if you wanted to bring in 100 people and you brought in 1,000? Could you handle it? Do you have the infrastructure for it? Do you have the support for it? Are you able to deliver an exceptional client experience? At what point do things break? And if you're looking at it isolated with one particular offer, it's easy to see those things. When you're trying to scale everything, sometimes you lose a lot of that because it's just so much, it's a bit overwhelming. And it does. It gets overwhelming. The bigger you get, the more you have to do, the more the problems, the more your time gets pulled away. And if you don't do it strategically, you run into problems. Now, I'll challenge you on one thing. We don't, we're not always interested in scaling what brings us the most revenue. We're more interested in scaling what brings us the most profitable revenue. And it's figuring out like, hey, this one little thing we do over here, people are paying us some, you know, compared to what we do, it's crazy wild. And so how do we build the market around that? Does that actually work? So that as you're scaling, you're automatically profitable and you're highly profitable. And and that's what the focus is on. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. And the way that I end up working with people is you only scale something that's profitable (laughs) because otherwise it needs to be leaned out. Unless you're doing something that's like a low top of funnel type offer where it's more, more to just get somebody in the door, that's totally different. But for your core offer, I think you always want to be looking at that and looking at how do I make this more profitable? 
How can I take some of the expense out of it? How can we simplify the way that we deliver it? How can we, you know, improve the client experience? How can we serve more people with the same amount of resources? I think that's where that optimization comes in, where you consistently want to be looking at, if this is my top performer, how do I keep making this more and more profitable? So I 100% agree with you. Glad to hear it. (laughs) (laughs) Too often people just, they look at top line revenue and they don't look at anything else. Oh, we're selling a bunch of these. Well, let's sell more. And they don't realize every time they sell it, they lose money. And so they scale their losses. And that's not what we want to do. Speaking of scaling losses, what are the biggest areas of waste that drain time and profits from a business? So for anybody who may be familiar with lean manufacturing or even lean in the software space, there's these common areas of waste that are pretty well known. And so what I've done is I've really looked at and analyzed What about a smaller business that's more of an online business in the coaching, consulting, more service-based space? What types of waste do they have that are really common and that get in their way of being able to scale in a simpler, sustainable way? And I identified 10 core areas of waste. And the first one will be absolutely no surprise to you whatsoever, I'm sure, and that is unnecessary complexity. That is a very, very big area of waste from potentially just doing way too much customization in proposals for people, um, doing way too much customization in what you do to overall too muchness, right? Having too many offers, having too many activities, having too many team members, like little bits of a lot of people instead of people more fully dedicated to things. And so unnecessary complexity is one of the biggest areas of waste for time, money, and energy and profit in a business. So that is number one, but it is certainly not the only one. (laughs) There are nine others um, that are really pretty common. Do you want to just kind of rip through them real quick or no? (laughs) I sure can. Okay. (laughs) So the next one is incomplete work. So... As the the visionary leader of your business, if that is uh, those of you listening, what do we love to do? We love new ideas. We don't always love implementing things. So what happens when your team has been working super hard on something and a new idea comes along is that thing doesn't get finished or ends up really taking such a long time that you lose the value of it. And so incomplete work is a big one. And so I'm a big fan of traction and integrators in working with the visionary. And I tell integrators, your number one job is to rein in your visionary and force them to pick between all the crazy ideas and not let them take you off on these wild goose chases until you're ready for the next chase. <laughs> Continue <laughs> yes on. Yes, do that. <laughs> we are our own worst enemy. It's like I'm my own integrator and my own visionary in my own business. It's like I battle with myself all the time. Um, but that being said, so the only thing worse than incomplete work is spending time on unneeded work at all. So investing time and energy in things that simply do not need to be done at all. They're not aligned with your vision. They're not aligned with your goals. They're not things that drive profit in the business. They're not things that your clients care about that you're investing all this time and energy into and they don't even care. um, And that's affecting your profitability. The next one I mentioned earlier, which is investing too much time in new versus optimizing what you already have. That is a really big one. Um, Searching. So as your business grows, as your team grows, as your business starts to scale, We spend a ridiculous amount of time searching for things because we don't always have good systems or good organization. We don't know where that document is. And I think there's an SOP for that. Where is it? We can't, we don't even remember what tool we have that does certain things. And so there's a lot of time spent searching under utilization of resources and that's people resources, that's financial resources, that's tools, tech, any of the resources in your business, poor quality, what I call fragmentation. So things that don't connect well together, knowledge depreciation, like you plan a project that's supposed to start six months from now. And by the time you get there, none of that time or effort that you put into it is valid anymore because so much time has passed or in your own programs, you have things that have become out of date and you don't have a regular way of keeping that up to date. And so the value starts to diminish in what you offer. And then finally delays right? Things just taking longer than you want, which delays you generating revenue. It delays you bringing profit into the business. 
everything always takes longer than you want. That should be standard. We tell people you got to build margin into everything. Put an extra all the way through the system. We try and build margin, both financially and time-wise, because nothing ever seems to get done when you say it will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm a big believer in capacity-based planning. You need to know how much capacity you have. You need to create your plans within that capacity, and you need to leave 30% open because I guarantee you, you underestimated how long something was going to take, how much something was going to cost, and things come out of left field all the time. (laughs) They do. So you've been talking about lean and lean out method and and what you do. Can you just share a little bit? What is it that you do with this? What is the method and what is it that you actually help people do? Absolutely. So I help people scale as I shared in simple, sustainable ways. And so the way that I've done that is I've identified nine core engines that every business really needs to scale. And so we look at and we work with our particular clients to assess where is the gap in their business right now? If they want to scale, where's the area that they should be focused on most right now that's going to give them the most leverage so they can get their time back, they can increase their profits, and they can actually scale their business. And so we do a lot of one-on-one consulting work with clients, but our whole method is really around helping them understand where they currently are and which things they should focus on to have the most leverage to get the results they want. Prioritization? Yeah, prioritization is key. So I have an entire um, strategic planning framework that I've developed that I've used for a little more than 22 years now. And so prioritization is a key part of that. I call it the lean strategic planning framework, which kind of takes the best of uh, lean and agile uh philosophies blended with what I think really a small scaling business needs, just enough adaptability and flexibility with just enough structure. It's like that sweet spot balance. And a key part of all of that is prioritization because entrepreneurs are idea generating machines. (laughs) They are. And maybe you can help with this because this comes up a lot and we really haven't found a great solution. Right. So I'm the entrepreneur. I've got 10 ideas and I've got six to do's. Is there a system out there that makes it easy to track and to put this all almost onto my calendar in ways that are as flexible and workable for people like us? Okay. So here is what I'm going to tell you. And some people will love this model. Some people will not. But I am a huge, huge fan of the tool Monday.com. I used it since they very first launched it back when it was called the Pulse. And I have an entire framework built in there. And to me, it's really about multiple layers of planning where you have that clarity long term on your vision. You've got your near-term goals for the next 90 days. You understand for the next month what your major projects and your marketing campaigns are. And then you have a place to track your day-to-day activities. I do not put it in my calendar, but how I use my calendar is I have set focus blocks that I leverage for how I work. And then I go to that board and I pull the most important things that are prioritized on that board during that focus block. That works really, really well for me and for a lot of my clients. Um, Some people want to see specifically on their calendar exactly what they're doing when. I like the flexibility of knowing that from 9 to 11, this is my like internal lean out method focus block. And I go out to my board and I pull um, during that time the most important, highest priority things that are in aligned with kind of my focus for that day. So I signed up for Monday. I, I didn't spend enough time learning how to use it. And I didn't figure out how to set up. I think my biggest problem is I didn't set up my boards in a way that worked for me. It Mm -hmm. wasn't as intuitive as I hoped it would be. And that's my fault for not taking the time to figure out how. And, And that's right. Isn't this the problem? We don't take the time to figure out how something works and how to customize it to us and make sure that we implement it correctly in our business. 
It's true because either you pick a tool that has a system that kind of locks you into their system and it may or may not fit for you, but I think you never want a tool to drive what you do. You want a tool to support what you do, or you pick a tool like Monday that's kind of wide open. You can do whatever you want with it, but without investing the time in architecting what you want, it can feel really hard to figure out how to set up or to come up with something that works really well for you. But I do think that usually those more wide open tools are the better ones. You just do need to take the time and have the strategy behind the outcomes and how you want to use them. Makes sense. Is there any other wisdom you'd like to share that we did not touch upon today? I think the one thing that I would share, and this is actually the very first thing that I do with all of my clients, is getting really, really clear on what your long-term vision is. And when I look at vision, I look at vision across three different facets. I think obviously there's the vision that you have for your business, but there's also the vision that you have for your role in the business and how that evolves and changes over time. And then there's also the vision that you have for your clients. Like who are your clients of tomorrow? What's the transformation of tomorrow or the problem of tomorrow that they're going to be looking for. And to me, if you have clarity on that, that should drive every single decision that you make in your business. And if you find yourself in a place where you're like, I'd really like to scale, but I have way too much on my plate. She says simplify, cool, but what can I possibly simplify right now? Looking back at your vision, you frequently can see a lot of things that maybe you're working on that are not taking you in the direction that you want to go. And so it's a really easy way to identify those things that you then have to put a plan around to actually cut or transition away from. But it can usually give you back some space and just give you the confidence that you're actually investing your time and resources in the right things. I'm a big fan of plane analogies. And so, you know, I talk about we take off in Los Angeles If we know we're going to JFK in New York, we know we're going to be off course 98% of the time. We're constantly making corrections. We may hit some turbulent weather and some storms along the way, but somehow that pilot always finds that teeny little runway at JFK and lands the plane. And he's got enough fuel to get there and, and he does it well because he picked the location. If you don't pick your destination and you don't have clarity on where you're going, it becomes very hard to go there. And I'll be honest, I think 98% of business owners have no idea where they're going. And if you ask them, what do you want? They won't give you a clear answer. I think you are correct. <laughs> that's that's what I experience. <laughs> that's what, and literally our first onboarding call, we spend two hours digging into learn about our client. We don't talk about the business very much for the two hours. We talk about them as people, where they've come from, what are their underlying behaviors and what do we have to worry about and where are we going and and all of those types of things. So we really try to get to know the person who's essentially sitting in the, the pilot seat and helping them figure out what's the destination that, that we're going to. If people would like to learn more about you, connect, talk about your services, what's the best way for them to do that? Absolutely. If you want to dig a little bit more into those 10 areas of waste, I actually have a free guide. It's leanoutmethod.com slash waste that you can grab, or you can just head to leanoutmethod.com and find all of the things, including the waste guide there and my podcast, uh, which is Lean Out Your Business Podcast. And we'll put that all in the show notes. Thank you so much for joining us today. Which of the small steps that Krista shared can you take to improve something in your business by 1%? Then what are nine more? Let's face it, 10% is a big difference. And it's okay if you only do 1% a month. Just take action to make more while working less because that's the way it should be which is why you don't need more resources. You need to be more resourceful. Remember to focus on the bottom line. If you'd like for us to be a part of your profitability journey, we have different programs available ranging from do-it-yourself to one-on-one coaching. Our course, The Profit Blueprint, teaches you everything you need to know to transform your profitability. There are three different tiers ranging from DIY to done with you so that businesses of all sizes can get the support that's best. 
Join the waitlist in the show notes to get more information and be a part of the next cohort. If you want a done for you service, you can hire us as your chief profitability officers. We only work with a handful of clients, so they all get our full attention. We work with business owners who have or are growing to half a million to 10 million in revenue. You can use the scheduling link in the show notes to get on our calendar for a good fit conversation to see if we're the right people to support you and how we can help you. This episode of the Profit Answer Man podcast is brought to you by smbpodcastnetwork.com. The network is a collection of podcasts and shows from around the internet, which focus on bringing you interviews with amazing guests who share actionable advice, ideas, and information for small and medium-sized business owners and entrepreneurs. Visit www.smbpodcastnetwork.com to find more great shows and easily subscribe to be notified of new episodes. It's a great way to discover quality content. If you've discovered us via the network, then I hope you enjoy today's show and will consider subscribing directly so you never miss our episodes. Remember to check out my other podcast, Richer Soul, where we talk about how to live the ultimate life and be the best business owner you can be. As we close out, let's repeat the mantra. Revenue is vanity, profit is sanity, and cash is king. Have an abundant and profitable week.